Today, we are back at John Kufleitner's to take a look at this 1962 Bubble Top Bel Air, but not just any Bubble Top Bel Air. This one is packing that legendary 409 that the Beach Boys sang about. I'm talking high horsepower 409. One horsepower per cubic inch. And guess what else? We got to drive this one. But before getting into all of that, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we cover the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are off the beaten path. We dive in deep. We show specs, period correct ads, as well as perceptions that other people simply don't show. If that sounds of interest to you, hit the subscribe button. Turn on the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Couple announcements or minutes real quick. If you are new to the channel, we have a poll in the community tab to vote for a time slot for this for watching these videos because we've been going at it since last September without a time slot. So we're just trying to get to a more consistent time of posting. Plus, for those that don't know or haven't gotten to the end of an episode, at the end of each episode, there is Name That Tune. So if we got to a more consistent time slot, it would give everybody a fair opportunity at that. Two ways of getting a hold of me. Leave a comment in the comment section. I read and answer all comments posted. The second way is we recently made a Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. No obligation to join, just simply saying that it's a thing. And I'm hoping one day that it will be a car community of car loving enthusiasts to share their wealth of knowledge with the younger generations. If you're interested, all of that information will be in the link in the description. Let's talk 1962 Chevy car offerings. Chevy offered 33 models in 1962. The Corvair had a whole line of cars. Moving to the Chevy 2, it was broke down in a Series 100, Series 300, and then Nova 400 series. Moving to the full-size cars, Biscayne, Bel Air in the center, Impala, and then there was the Corvette. A little bit of background on what the Bel Air trim level was. The Bel Air was a full-size car produced by Chevy from 1950 to 1975 model years with seven generations. In the beginning, only the two-door hardtops wore the Bel Air badge from 1950 to 1952. 1953 saw the Bel Air name go from a designation to a unique body shape. Then it became the Hero Halo trim, to the mediocre, and then it finally became the basement model before production ceased in 1975. It's important to point out that the Canadian production lasted until 1981 model year. 1962 model year falls in the fifth generation, which was produced from 1961 to 1964. In 1962, Chevy offered the Bel Air in four body types, four-door wagon, four-door sedan, two-door sedan, two-door hardtop. Built on the GM B-Body platform, 1962 was the final year for the Bel Air Sports Coupe. Oh, and fun fact, the Beach Boys hit 409 came out in 1962. Bel Airs had that bubble top look while Impala's got a new sculpted convertible style look. Let's talk for a minute. For those that didn't know, Chevy had different roof options. Well, technically Cadillac started in the late 50s, but it trickled down to Chevy and Chevys are more or less remembered for this in the early 60s. Anyway, there was the bubble top look. The easiest way to tell if it's a bubble top is look at the A pillar and see how it curves. It curves sort of like a bubble, hence the name. This is a flat top. Notice the rear and how it overhangs and all of its flat topness at the top. Coupe had a different top, the sedan top, convertible top, Impala top. Moving on to some specs, 209.6 inches long, 79 inches wide, and it rides a wheelbase of 119 inches. Price, $2,560, which was equivalent to you spending $28,399 in year 2022. Total Chevy production for 1962 is 
8,677 units, of which the hardtop sports coupe variety, they made 323,427 units. Weighs 3,893 pounds. Moving on to engines, 1962 Chevy offered eight different engine options. The basement engine was a 153.3 cubic inch displacement, inline four cylinder, 2.5 liters. Makes 90 brake horsepower at 4,000 RPM with a bore of 3.9 inches and a stroke of 3.3 inches. Compression 8.5 to 1 has five main bearings built out of cast iron single barrel carburetor. Taking one step out of the basement, 194.4 cubic inch displacement inline six, 3.2 liters. It makes 120 brake horsepower at 4,400 RPM with a bore of 3.6 inches and a stroke of 3.3 inches. Compression 8.5 to one has seven main bearings built of cast iron single barrel carburetor. Moving up the ladder, 235 cubic inch displacement inline six, 3.9 liters. It's good for 135 horsepower at 4,000 RPM with a bore of 3.6 inches and a stroke of 3.9 inches. Compression 825 to one, four main bearings built of cast iron and is fed with one barrel carburetor. Moving to the first V8 option, 283 cubic inch displacement overhead valve V8, 4.6 liters. It makes 170 horsepower at 4,200 RPM, 275 foot-pounds of torque at 2,200 RPM with a bore of 3.9 inches and a stroke of 3 inches. Compression, 8.5 to 1. Five main bearings wrapped in cast iron. It is fed with a two-barrel carburetor. Next one is 327 cubic inch displacement overhead valve V8, 5.4 liters. This one makes 250 horsepower at 4,400 RPM, 350 foot-pounds of torque at 2,800 RPM with a bore of 4 inches and a stroke of 3.3 inches. Compression, 10.5 to 1. Five main bearings made of cast iron fed with a four-barrel carburetor. Moving to the second 327 option, overhead valve V8, 5.4 liters. This one produces 300 horsepower at 5,000 RPM, 360 foot-pounds of torque at 3,200 RPM with a bore of four inches and a stroke of 3.3 inches. Compression is the same, 10.5 to one. Five main bearings, cast iron, but this one, it has dual quads. Up next, 409 cubic inch displacement overhead valve V8, 6.7 liters makes 380 horsepower at 6,000 rpm 420 foot pounds of torque at 3200 rpm with a bore of four inches and a stroke of 3.3 inches compression 11.1 to one it is built out of cast iron and it is fed with one single four barrel carburetor the next engine is the engine that is in our car this is the penthouse suite of engine options at the top of the heap, this one's 409 cubic inch displacement, overhead valve, V8, 6.7 liters. It makes one horsepower per cubic inch, 409 horsepower at 5,800 RPM with 420 foot-pounds of torque at 4,000 RPM with a bore of four inches and a stroke of 3.3 inches. Compression is the same, 11.1 .1 to one, five main bearings, cast iron feeding this engine is not one but two carburetors also known as dual quads moving on to transmissions three speed manual four speed manual two speed power glide it's also very important to mention that chevy discontinued the turbo glide making the power glide the only automatic transmission on offer look at this door panel and all the materials used i love the bright work here nice armrest as well as door handle to pull the door shut this is the door handle to get out this is the window crank for the vent window i honestly think that's so classy to have a vent window crank giant window crank for the big window and just look at how it's all framed out here this is the bel air too just keep that in mind so it's all nice and framed out Coming down here to inside the pedal box section. This is the parking brake or emergency brake. This is the parking brake release up here. Right here, this is the clutch pedal, brake pedal, 
accelerator pedal. Over here, underneath the floor mat, I got called out because I didn't explain what this is. This is for the high beam switch. I honestly believe that it should be on the floor. That's a really good place for it, but I understand why they moved it. It's because if you have to push the clutch down, it's really hard to push the high beam switch if you have to depress the clutch at the same time. So here's a vent. This op opens the vent for right here, this vent down here. It, that's for the windshield wipers. Put it over here, right underneath where the key goes. I believe that's for the choke, but I don't think it's hooked up in this car. On to the button switches and knobs, starting all the way to the left. That almost looks like a cigarette lighter, but when you pull it out, it actually turns on the headlights. This is a super basic dashboard layout. Long style speedometer with odometer at the bottom center. Then there are three pods right below the speedometer. The first one is the temperature, which are lights. When you start the car, it says cold until the temperature gets up to a certain temperature, whatever the thermostat is set to, and then it'll go off. And if it starts to overheat, it will show up as a red light, which I think is stupid. There's no gauge. Right next to it would be where the clock is located, but they were too cheap to get the clock, so there is no clock there. And I love how companies just kept that gauge there, just blank. Oh, what's that gauge for? Oh, that's the clock. They didn't. They decided not to get it. But anyway, right next to it is the gas gauge. And that's it. That's, those are the only gauges that you have. There is one more gauge, an added on gauge after the fact, an RPM gauge right here on the left hand side of the steering wheel column. Getting inside, I'm going to show you my feet placement for getting inside. This is how I just get in like that and then just slide on in. This is what over the hood impression looks like. This is what first person looks like. Here's, you got sun visors and here's my hand for reference. These are really big sun visors. Daytime, nighttime mirror here. It's on daytime. When you flip it to nighttime, it says night. So that's really cool. Here's another sun visor over here, the very big sun visors, but no courtesy mirrors. Just look at the dashboard, how it's designed. This sits back in here further and this protrudes out farther. This is the ashtray. There's no cigarette lighter. That's, that's interesting. Maybe it wasn't here and it has cigarette lighter delete or they just didn't get it. All right, on to the glove box test. Here is our test subject. Here is my hand for reference. This is the camera that we use for all the cinematic shots of the dashboard and stuff. It's a very big camera. We're gonna stick it in this glove box and see if it fits. So there's the glove box. Here's our camera. It, it does kind of sort of fit, but... Yeah, there we go. It fits in the glove box. Here's what under the steering wheel looks like. Lots of space underneath the steering wheel. And this steering wheel is gigantic. It's pretty big. Here's what the horn sounds like. All right, getting in the back seat. So we're just gonna fold the seat forward. Look at how much space there is back here. There's lots of space. I'm gonna stick my hand here just for reference of how much space there is. There's a lot of space. All right, getting in the rear seat. All right, there's lots of lighting in this car. We have lights here, as well as a coat hook here. And then on the other side, there is also another light over here, as well as another coat hook. So two lights in the back that illuminate everything pretty well back here. I have lots of headspace. It's very comfortable back here. The seat is in the upright position, more upright than I would like to sit. So that could, it could get kind of like, it almost feels like a church pew now sitting in it for a minute but I got adequate leg room. Nice armrest here for driving pleasure. Armrest on that side as well. And you can see the seat profile. It's more upright than it usually is. The seat bottom is quite a bit recessed. 
see you can see the line that's why I show you this to show you how this seat actually looks up against a straight surface what the rear windshield looks like with the shelf back there visibility in this car is really good and I will also say something as to the front seat when you're driving this car down the road you sit in it it almost feels like sitting in like a canoe or something like that like I don't know if canoe is a good analogy but you definitely sit in this car not on it this is what the front the back to front view looks like also want to make a point that I love the fact when the seats don't lock then you're not stuck back here so to get out you just push the seat forward but before we get out I want to show you how this window works so just check out how big this window is so that's one crank that's two cranks that's three cranks it takes three and a half cranks to get to the top but that is one big piece of glass and just to show you what this looks like going down so we stop we stopped right here at the bottom so that's one crank two cranks three cranks it's almost four cranks really that is a big piece of glass all right getting underneath the hood so it's really quite simple you just pull up on this and that releases this part here but you kind of have to do it all in one motion so you have to hold this and then pull up on this it's hard to do with a camera in your hand just look at that engine 409 turbo fire it claims 409 horsepower so that's one horsepower per cubic inch if you're counting and it fits in here with room to spare like it actually looks kind of small in this engine bay generator master cylinder right there notice it's a single master cylinder no power brake booster attached to it and column comes down into the rack or down it's right here I love how it's all exposed like that and you can get to it and work on it easily if you have to so shutting the hood you just get it down to here and just push it shut all right getting in and starting the 409 so it's always a good idea now you don't have to do this but it's always a good idea to push the clutch down so if it is in gear it doesn't take off on you and you just uh, give the give it just a wee bit of gas sloppy the shifter does 
and it's, the throws are pretty far apart. I drove the Cobra yesterday. I'm not sure when this video is going to go up, but the Cobra, it was real tight. This one, the, the throws are far apart and the shifter kind of, it's kind of sloppy to be honest. The clutch engages when it's about halfway out, but the clutch is not heavy in this car whatsoever. This one has the 409 in it and it's, it's really quite fun to drive. The only thing that's really wrong with it is once you, put, you push the accelerator pedal down, it stays at full tilt unless you rev it up real fast like that again and then it goes back to the way that it's supposed to be. So it might be an accelerator pump issue, it might be a linkage issue, we're gonna figure all that out. It's got great pulling power too. I'm in fourth gear, we're going about 50 miles an hour. The speed limit's 60, 65. When I get to the bottom of this hill, I'm gonna I'm gonna give her I'm gonna goose her a little bit. We're gonna downshift it here to third real quick. Vapor lock there. It was either vapor lock or we're running out of gas. It could be could be either one. It must be I'm running out of gas. I better get this There's back. An awesome aspect that nobody shows. We ran out of gas. How hard is it to push this car? Let's find out. So I'm gonna bump it with my knees a little bit to get it going. And then I'm gonna push it. It's a really heavy car, this one is. I wouldn't want to push this car a couple miles down the road. It's, it's very heavy. Before moving on to the pros and cons section, because that's generally what we talk about, I want to talk to you and tell you about what this drives like. The sound quality didn't come across on the footage as what this is like in real life. This engine sounds like, have you ever heard Van Halen Hot for Teacher? Whenever it's coming in with the drums, that's exactly what this car sounds like. Exactly. Maybe they modeled it, their, their drum intro of their song, after the legendary 409 dual quad car because it sounds identical. This thing, you'd have to have balls the size of my head to drive it like a race car because once you get it going a certain speed, 65 miles an hour is all the faster I ever took this. But when you're going down a hill going 65, it's very floaty. Like you can feel the wind come up underneath it and start to pick it up kind of floaty. It handles like a Lincoln Mark V almost, but it's got an insane engine in it. It's The other crazy thing is, is the clutch pedal is not heavy at all. Usually with a big, huge muscular engine, like big horsepower, high cubic inch engine, the clutch is usually heavy, really, really heavy. It wasn't the case in this. The shifter, on the other hand, the shifter in my truck was better than the shifter in this car. I like whenever you put it in first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, whatever. I like the fact when it clicks into gear. It doesn't do that in this car. And the gear shifts are further apart than they are in my truck. But the action was smooth. And you could definitely tell where the shifter was. I just wasn't a fan of how sloppy it was and how far the sh throws were. But that's a personal preference thing. All right, moving on to the pros and cons. I'm getting all these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, Blue Chip Auto Investment, 70 years from 1930 to 2000 by Richard M. Langworth and the auto editors of Consumer Guide. On the positive side, this book is a little bit outdated, but it says still relatively inexpensive. Perhaps the next collector cars after the 1955 through 57 Bel Airs, crisp, styling high performance reproduction parts are available against it all the faults in which big cars have been cursed with it's got fuel thirst indifferent construction quality on to name that tune first person to give me the correct band and title of song will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. I really appreciate all of the support. And until next time, toodaloo!